Good evening everyone, welcome back. This is Repeat and we are going to be summarizing uh, module 3 tonight. It's uh, pretty much the same thing as uh, course 1. I don't know which module but uh, this is li literally we've learned this in car uh, course 1. So we're gonna go ahead and quickly move through this so we don't waste any time. So in lesson one they talk about detached and attached residential structures basically detached attached semi detached and a linked residential stru uh, structure uh, the difference between them you already know uh, dwelling single family dwelling is one house um, sorry it's a dwelling unit a housing that uh, has one or more habitable rooms a single family is just a, a single du a single dwelling unit. So types, uh, there's different styles of uh, single family residential structures, which are bungalow, one and a half story, two stories, and split split level. Um, I'm just gonna go through them so you can see. You can read it if you want to. You can pause the video and read it anytime. But I already know this, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. And then they talk about residential structures. There's uh, multi-unit residential structures, which are duplex, two units, uh, triplex, three units, and fourplex, obviously four units. They're all separate, by the way. So we're going to move on to lesson two, uh, fundamentals of ownership. And they talk about... Uh, fee simple and leasehold interest interests <clears throat> excuse me so in fee simple is the highest of, uh, form of ownership with the fewest number of restrictions uh, while leasehold is an occupancy right not a form of ownership and has fewer rights than the fee simple so uh, some of the rights that come with fee simple are you can sell lease use do nothing give away and enter the property and then they have government Private limitations to ownership can impact the listing and selling process. Primary government limitations include right to take the property, right to regulate, right to levy taxes, and then private limitations include restrictive covenants and easements. Concurrent uh, ownership basically is when two or more people hold simultaneous uh, simultaneous ownership in a property. Joint tenancy is basically when. Um, uh, joint tenancy occurs when four criteria known as unities under current concurrent ownership exist unity of time unity of interest unity of possession and unity of title joint tenancy is dis distinguished by the rights of survivorship tenants in common uh, is only require only requires a unity of possession and does not include the right of survivorship tenants in common have very different interests in the property and may acquire those interests in different ways at different times sellers and buyers should be referred to a lawyer to, for advice and guidance regarding concurrent ownership that was lesson two let's move on to lesson three lesson three means ownership alternatives and we're gonna go all the way to the end because we're just gonna summarize this uh, condominiums <clears throat> condominiums consist of fee simple interest in a unit and co-ownership interest as a tenant in common uh, Considerations when purchasing a condominium, maintenance fees, rules and bylaws, and the board of directors to oversee the corporation. Uh, equity corporate, cor cooperative. Equity cooperative is a form of ownership in which a buyer purchases a share in the corporation that owns the property. An occupancy agreement is required to identify which unit corresponds with the share per purchase. Considerations when purchasing an equity con corporation is the maintenance fees, uh, which includes property taxes, rules and bylaws, the board of directors to oversee the day-to-day -day business, and obligations to pay proportionate shares of financing on the property. Co-ownership. Co-ownership is a fractional uh, interest in in land which one or more owners as a tenant in common uh, considerations when purchasing uh, co-ownership is may it may include 
uh, occupancy agreement the co-ownership agreement will set out to the set out the rules regarding maintenance and management of the property and jointly liable for any mortgage or other expenses related to the property life lease life lease complex provides a buyer with the right to occupy for a life lease unit for their lifetime they require an up upfront payment and monthly fees life lease pr projects are developed by non-profit organizations charities and clubs the life lease or life lease organization is called the sponsor land lease land lease communities consist of ownership of a structural a uh, structure situation situated on leased land structures can be seasonal such as manufacture such as a manufacturer uh, manufactured or mobile home or permanent such as modular home a land lay a land lease tenant is required to pay a monthly maintenance fee as well as a fee to the lease uh, to lease the site there is no standard lease agreement so a tenant should seek legal advice prior to entering into a lease agreement so that was lesson three moving on to lesson four municipal rule role in land use planning <clears throat> excuse me the purpose of the planning act that it sets out the regulatory guidelines for land use planning on in ontario the planning act is administered under the ministry of municipal affairs and housing the planning act sets out specific provincial interests to guide municipalities uh, when making planning decision. Under the Municipal Act and in, in keeping with the Planning Act, the municipalities of Ontario play a key role in land use planning. Upper tier are responsible for pre preparing, implementing and revising the official plan as needed and dividing and developing, developing land. Lower tiers share the responsibility of upper tiers in preparing, implementing and revising the official plan. Single tiers uh, may assume all municipal responsibilities where a municipality does not form part of an upper tier municipality. Your listing and selling transactions may be impacted by municipal land use restrictions. Oh my god. Okay. The selling land under the Planning Act. Before ownership of a land can be transferred, the, stat the status of the property must comply with the subdivision control provisions of the Planning Act. By the time a salesperson is involved, this has most likely already happened. To ensure a new property lot can be legally transferred, seller must contact their local planning appeal tribunal. In some cases, a consent of severance suff suff suffices. suffices. God, I can't pronounce this word. Uh, while in others, a plan of subdivision may be required. Uh, okay, new trends in land use. Intensification is an alternative uh, to severances and subdivisions that address increasing housing demands. Intif intensification involves expanding the use of existing lands and buildings and using existing municipal services rather than increasing housing through expanding urban spaces. That was lesson four. We are moving on to lesson five, official plan and zoning. <clears throat> so the purpose the official plans purpose is to describe how land within a municipality should be used in adherence to the planning act okay sounds good zoning bylaws zoning bylaws are enacted by a municipality to dictate how property can be used sounds good typical zoning classifications Residential properties are divided into zoning subclasses. The action or, or process of assigning parts of a town or a piece of land to categorize subject to different restrictions on use and development. Wow. The impact of zoning. Other considerations regarding existing zoning bylaws include a zoning bylaw amendment, a minor variance through the committee of adjustment, impact of a legal non-conforming status. That was lesson five, and we are moving on to lesson six, considerations for heritage properties. 
So, <clears throat> why is a property given heritage designation? The Ontario Heritage Act grants the province and its municipalities the power to identify and preserve properties that have cultural heritage value because communities are not built solely through new developments but within an understanding of their history. There is a designation process of the property uh, sorry, the, there is a designation process that the property must go through that identifies heritage attributes, example features that the municipality deem to be cultural her heritage values and wants to protect. What kind of properties can be included on a municipal uh, heritage register? Properties that qualify for heritage designation include individual buildings or structures, groups of bro groups of buildings vacant laws, lots or other properties that may be considered areas of historical or archaeological ah, archaeological potential. Did I pronounce that right? I don't know. One second. Archaeological. Archaeological. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are three classifications for properties that can be included on municipal register. So listed. Um, <clears throat> Listed, not yet designated, but included by the municipality if they may. Uh, A. Want to designate the property in the future. B. Want to protect the property from demolition because it may, uh, may have cultural value. Um, designated properties approved as individual heritage properties through the designation pro process. Uh, designated properties that are part of an approved heritage conservation district. The owner must submit a permit application for any proposed work or obtain written consent from the municipal council before making any changes that could impact the heritage attributes of the property. Any plan that might result in the loss, damage, uh, alteration, or removal of one or more designated heritage attributes on a property requires approval for, from the municipal council before work can begin. Okay. So you do need permission to do any change uh, to your historical property. Restrictions and limitations. There may be restrictions and limitations in the ownership of a heritage property that you will need to be aware, be aware of and disclose during the selling and buying process. A designated property may carry an easement or restrictive covenant on the title. Easements and restrictive covenants are usually entered into the owner of uh, excuse me, in, entered into by the owner with the Ontario Heritage Trust or their municipality in exchange for tax breaks or other financial support. What are some of the salesperson's obligations regarding heritage properties? Well, you will be able to, or you will be able to um, research the heritage properties, make uh, required disclosures including any material facts act in the client's best interest and know when to advise from other uh, service uh, know when to advise services from others so that was pretty much lesson six lesson seven is the summary practice activities we're not going to go through that module summary is basically everything we've already talked about so this is the end of module three uh, it was basically whatever we learned in course one, just a summary of it. Uh, so yeah, I will be doing module four soon. So tune in. Thank you. Have a good night.